There were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Do you think Mrs. Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. So, people love compelling true life stories, especially when it relates to public figures, and most importantly, when that story is a tragedy. It is therefore no surprise that Princess Diana's story, of her rise into the royal family, the troubles she faced within it, and the tragic end to her life, is one that has been told numerous times through biographies, documentaries, and portrayals on film and television. In now almost 25 years since she passed, interest in the princess and her story are showing no signs of subsiding. If anything, there seems to be a big resurgence in interest over recent years. For this video, I want to put aside the million biographies and documentaries, and instead focus on the content with dramatization as their basis. The biopics, the good ones, the bad ones, and the god-awful ones. I don't have the most positive association with the word biopic, which is strange when The Aviator, Walk the Line, Moneyball, The Social Network, Goodfellas, Mishima, Schindler's List, and many others are some of my favorite movies of all time. The reason biopics can get a bad rep is because, more often than not, they are an easy way to make something that gets quick attention. Look, it's the Steve Jobs movie and Ashton Kutcher is playing him. Look, it's the Nina Simone movie played by Zoe Saldana. They are not setting out to make a movie that says something interesting or tries something new. They are simply taking a famous actor, putting them in a famous role, and dramatizing the real life story on a very basic level. And what makes it even more frustrating is that, unless the movie is a complete train wreck like the Nina Simone biopic, audiences and award shows will eat it up. They love seeing famous people transform themselves into other famous people. Almost half of the acting nominations at this year's Academy Awards went to actors playing real-life people. Even the acting nomination that was considered the biggest snob of the year was Lady Gaga playing a real-life icon. Father, son, and house of Gucci. I've watched them all, and to me they are all either fine or forgettable, with one notable exception. But that's for later in this video. Point is, if you can get yourself to speak like Margaret Thatcher, just go ahead and pick up your statuette. It doesn't matter if the movie itself is good, or whether it will be forgotten about in two months. Original stories have to be twice as good to get the same amount of attention that a mediocre biopic does. You're crying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. The 2013 movie, Diana was clearly one of those attempts at getting on the award season radar. Thankfully, that attempt failed because this is not a good movie. They followed the correct formula of taking a famous, two-time Academy Award nominated actress in Naomi Watts, put her in the famous role of Princess Diana, and then dramatized Diana's story on a very basic level. The only reason it failed is because this movie is so painfully boring, even by the standards set by other tedious biopics that still managed to gain some buzz, like J. Edgar. I lied when I said Diana didn't get any award show attention, because this movie was actually nominated for Worst Actress at the Razzies. That was Naomi Watts' second nomination of the night, along with Worst Actress for Movie 43. She lost both to Tyler Perry as Medea. I'll defend Naomi Watts for a second and say that, while her performance is nowhere near as good as some of the ones I'll get into later in this video, she was competent enough in the role and it's the writing that really let her down. The movie provides absolutely zero insight into Princess Diana's life, it presents you with nothing to think about. Instead, you just have to sit through almost two hours of a very sanitized depiction of the final two years of Diana's life, whittling all the complexities down to problems with relationships and media attention. Hollow is the best word I can use to describe it. It is the problem with far too many biopics. There's nothing there. They made a Princess Diana movie for the sake of making a Princess Diana movie. I did not believe that anyone involved had a genuine interest in the actual person, or the most interesting complex aspects of her life. But this is not even the worst adaptation of Princess Diana's story that I've seen, because while it is boring, at the very least it is not degrading. Which brings me to part two. Last November, a Princess Diana musical opened on Broadway. It was originally going to open in March of 2020, and we all know what the state of the world was like during that month. So during the very long postponement of the musical, a production of it was filmed with no audience, and a month before it opened on Broadway, it was released on Netflix, titled Diana the Musical. 
Now I know this is technically a stage musical, but a biopic is a film that dramatizes the real life of a non-fictional person, and that is exactly what Diana the Musical on Netflix is doing. So for the sake of this video, let's just count it as a Princess Diana biopic, in quotes. And I could not think of a worse way to dramatize the life of Princess Diana than turning it into a song and dance. And the hate came pouring out. Yes, the hate came pouring out. You will not be shocked to hear that this musical ended its run after just one month on Broadway, and deservedly so, because this musical is a mess in so many ways. I could easily go scene by scene and rip it to shreds, with quotes like, serves me right for marrying a Scorpio, or Harry my ginger-haired son you'll always be second to none, or an AIDS patient singing, I may be unwell but I'm handsome as hell. To just walk through the entire thing bit by bit. But instead what I want to do is focus on the big picture of why this is so bad. I think a huge misconception people have over why Diana was and remains such an adored figure is that she was a perfect innocent princess trapped in a royal household. That is why adaptations easily make her a very vanilla character, stripping her of everything that makes her interesting. There definitely is a particular set of people that glorify her to the extreme, and that is who this musical is trying to cater to. But what they didn't understand is that that is not what most people are drawn to. Most see that there is more than one dimension to Diana. The reason people are so captivated by Princess Diana's life story is not just because she was famous and loved by so many. It's not just the fashion and how good she was in front of a camera. It's because the fame and love was juxtaposed with a woman that was fighting her own dark personal demons. A woman that was harming herself and dealing with eating disorders. Married into a family that didn't treat her very well to say the least. A woman hounded by extremely intense media attention. Media attention that eventually killed her as she literally tried to run away from it. And while she is a victim of all the above, She's also a woman who knew how to manipulate the media. She knew how to be calculated, she knew how to get people to love her, and she wasn't this docile, lamb-like figure that biopics strip her down to. So when you're going to reenact a dramatized version of this story, it makes no sense to take out the latter half of what made this story grip the attention of people worldwide. Yet, when the format you've chosen to tell the story, for whatever reason, is a musical, a musical, then you've left yourself with no choice but to paint an incomplete picture. Because what is already a pretty insulting and embarrassing format to tell a tragic story would be a million times worse if you sang about the real issues she was dealing with. Which is why this musical completely ignores all the dark stuff. Stuff that is important context to fully understanding her story. They ignore it because they know if they stayed true to the problems Diana was facing, beyond her cheating husband and a love triangle, the musical would come across as even more degrading than it already does. So all they focus on are the big, marketable Princess Diana moments. Like, oh look, it's the wedding dress. Oh look, it's the revenge dress. Let's be very clear that this was a shameless cash grab. I don't care what the creators say, this was not made with a single care in the world for the real person and her story. What happened was, they saw the resurgence of interest in Princess Diana that's been happening in recent years, and they thought enough time had passed that they could get away with a musical and make some money off of her story. So they quickly wrote together some childhood level rhyming such as a thriller in Manila with Diana and Camilla, and then lazily stitched together all of Diana's big recognizable moments into one narrative. During the marketing, they claimed that the musical was about humanizing her, seeing the person behind the flashes of the camera. But that's complete bull. This musical is the flash of the camera. It is all about taking the flashiest bits of Diana's legacy and exploiting it to the fullest extent that they could, given the runtime. The musical is so fixated on including every big moment from the wedding, everything in between, and ending on the car crash for dramatic effect. Princess Diana has died that it moves through her life at a lightning pace and it does the complete opposite of humanizing her. It turns her into a caricature. It reduces her down to these moments that we all already knew about. And it doesn't even do these moments justice. Look, I love the revenge dress photos. I have no problem with moments like this being included in any dramatization of Princess Diana's story. Because moments like this do perfectly encapsulate how clever she was at using the media to fight back against the royal family and reclaim her narrative. And how she didn't have to try very hard to get everyone talking. She did all that just by wearing a dress. But first of all, if you're going to do it, do not turn it 
it into a grandiose musical number that made me want to gouge my eyes out. And secondly, iconic, recognizable moments work way better when they are sprinkled into the narrative, not when they are the entire meat of the story, because then the person doesn't feel real. It feels like a parody. Take Jackie Kennedy, for example. The image of her standing in her pink suit, stained with the blood of her husband who was killed right next to her, as Lyndon B. Johnson is sworn in as the next president of the United States, is an iconic, recognizable image, not only because of how tragic it is, but also with the added knowledge that she did it deliberately. A change of clothes was waiting for her, but she kept on the stained suit so she could quote, let them see what they've done. And in the biopic, Jackie, this was recreated brilliantly. But you also don't get the sense that the entire point of this biopic is to recreate this iconic image and have Jackie Kennedy be nothing other than a woman in a blood-stained pink suit. Diana the Musical was banking on audiences being too stupid to care about what kind of Diana they are shown. They were banking on audiences wanting nothing but dresses. A pretty, pretty girl in a dress. Pablo Lorraine, with Jackie on the other hand, made a movie that is about more than just Jackie Kennedy's public life, as all biopics should do. Show what we've seen as a public, but also pull back the curtain and show the person we never got to see, the positive and the negative, to paint a full picture. And speaking of Pablo Lorraine, I think it's about time we talk about Spencer. We should really get going. Will they kill me, do you think? I love Spencer. It is the anti-biopic biopic, in the sense that unlike Diana 2013, it has no interest in maintaining the boring biopic formula. And unlike the musical, when this is advertised as an intimate look at Princess Diana behind the flashes of the camera, they mean it. Pablo Lorraine made the choice to ignore all the showy stuff and instead focus on one moment in time when she's making the decision to leave Prince Charles. Some of the criticism aimed at Spencer is that it is largely fictionalized. I couldn't care less and I love that he didn't put on a facade of this happened exactly as I'm showing it. And in fact, many biopics are largely fictionalized because when you were showing moments and conversations that we, the public, were not there for, moments that weren't filmed in real life, then you have to make it up. The difference with Spencer is they aren't trying to pretend that they are recreating events exactly as they happened. 30 minutes into the movie, we get the incredible dinner scene where she's so distressed that she breaks her pearl necklace and begins eating the pearls. Right away, it's telling you that this is a different approach to the biopic and it is not going to follow the formula that you were used to. The starting point of making this movie was not thinking about the flashy moments from Diana's life and recreating them. It was about asking the question, what was Diana feeling at this moment in time? What would it feel like to be in that environment, under that kind of pressure, on top of all the mental health problems that we know she had? They then made a movie with her feelings as the foundation, translating that pressure, anxiety, and chaos to audiences so we could feel it with her. Spencer does present Diana as a victim trapped in a royal household. But the difference between this and the previous biopics is that it is far from a pristine depiction of the real person. Vanilla is not a word you would use to describe this. They show the reality of her disorders and the effect her behavior must have had on her children. Spencer doesn't make as if the Diana we saw as a public was the same as how she was when the cameras weren't there. It doesn't care whether she is behaving reasonably or whether she's presented as innocent and likable to the audience. Which is why despite all the surrealism, it feels a million times more human than the other depiction. And the movie definitely suffered for it in terms of the award season circuit that biopics cater to. It didn't sweep the way people were anticipating before it came out. It was nominated for one Oscar, one Golden Globe, zero BAFTAs. And I guarantee had he taken a more conservative approach, a more polished Diana, it would be getting a lot more recognition while also being a lot more forgettable. That's not to say that I believe all biopics should follow a surrealist, unconventional approach. I watched The Crown, which maintains a very standard, these are the events and moments we know. To an extent, this is how it all unfolded. Now let's dramatize that approach. And it does this very well helped immensely by the writing and acting on the show. And also that it has a lot of time to move through the story, so the balance between the iconic moments and the quieter private moments to remind us that these are real people was balanced right. And I would put the Crown's version of Diana in the good category. And I would put Spencer in the great category. 
it is such a breath of fresh air, not only because it deviated from a formula that's getting tiresome, but also because, amongst all this new Princess Diana oversaturation, the new stories, the musical, the crown, re-releasing designer bags she wore and naming them after her, the countless podcasts, the documentaries, at least we are finally presented with something that can genuinely say it is taking an approach to her story that hasn't been done a million times already. You don't get the sense that he was simply jumping at the opportunity to capitalize off of the growing interest in Princess Diana. Spencer set out to try something new and I'm so happy it did. I don't know about you, but I think we've seen more than enough now. Spencer and the crown should be the end to this Diana resurgence. I know that will not be the case, and yet another adaptation of her story is bound to come up. One that will pivot back to this pristine formula I hate, but as far as I'm concerned, it ends here. I'm not interested in watching any more of them. So there you have it, as far as Princess Diana biopics go, these are what I consider the good, the bad, and the ugly. Congratulations Kristen Stewart on your Oscar nomination. Thank you all for watching. Bye. She really does make a fuss, this one, doesn't she? Not like Anne Boleyn, who offered her head to